which is the first one you've done live stream or you, have you I, done it before? I did one uh, last month um, and it worked out pretty well. So, and I didn't, I didn't bungle it up too much. So. We're, we're All right. <laughs> All right, Paul, it's great to have you here. Uh, hello, audience. This is Rich Devini, and I'm here today with Paul Zach. Um, Paul is a pioneer in the field of neuroeconomics, focused on uncovering how the hormone oxytocin produces trust. Paul is the founding director of the Center for Neuroeconomic Studies and professor of economics, uh, psychology, and management at Claremont Graduate University. He has degrees in mathematics and economics from San Diego State University a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania and a postdoctoral training in neuroimaging from Harvard. And his research on oxytocin and relationships has earned him the nickname Dr. Love. And Paul and I met uh, uh, a, a, little, a little while ago, uh, became fast friends, I think, in just a 40 minute conversation, but I've been so excited to talk to you, Paul. And, um, and a lot of what I talk, talk about uh, and nowadays certainly is trust, but my, my former profession, a lot of trust involved. Um, so we're going to get into trust. We're going to get into oxytocin. Uh, but if I could just have you talk and explain to us and the audience, what exactly is neuro uh, neuroeconomics? What is that? So I know, Rich, that you have never made a bad decision in your life. But your brother-in-law, who was buying investment real estate in 2007, when everyone knew it was a real estate bubble, what's the deal with that? So um, neuroeconomics measures reactivity while people make decisions uh, to understand where decisions come from, how to improve decisions. And I think it's a very humble field. Uh, I think when you're on, the, on my front lines in the laboratory, your front lines, you see people who are able to switch left or right. And you go, gosh, that's really interesting. So I think to understand behavioral diversity, neural diversity, decision-making is the kind of crux for that. So once they understand where decisions come from, individual and group decisions, I think we have great insight into human nature and human behavior. Yeah, wow, that's fascinating. I mean, there's there's enough just to dive into decision making there, and and uh, and we will in a second because I really want to kind of get into oxytocin, the 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 molecule you've spent so much time studying. And I want to actually ask you maybe not uh, the first question, but how that relates to decision making. Um, but before we get into kind of what oxytocin does and all of the, the, the um, nuances of it, can you explain to us the molecule and how you came about it and what oxytocin is and, and how it kind of relates to trust? Great. Uh, so uh, it's easy to study bad behavior in the lab. You know, I do that, I can make your heart rate, right? It's easy, right? So fear responses are easy to generate because they're survival instincts. But uh, studying positive human behaviors teamwork, high performance, good decision-making is actually kind of hard to do. And so people had just not studied it. And uh, I'm a very, very lazy person, Rich. So I just wanted to take, you know, virgin territory in my research and go, well, no one's doing this. Maybe I can figure that out. So yeah. um, as we started looking at um, where trust com comes from, which is embedded in every aspect of our lives, right? You trusted that I would show up for this live stream. We get an airplane. I mean, everything we do has some degree of trust embedded in it. Yeah. Because we're social creatures, we're embedded in communities. Um, from the animal literature, we knew a lot about this, this neurochemical oxytocin that seemed to signal safety or familiarity, but there wasn't a, a way to really measure this effectively in humans. So it's a very fragile molecule. It's ancient in origin, goes back at least 400 million years to a version in fish. But it seems to be a key signaling molecule for things are cool, yeah. roughly speaking. Uh, so we developed a protocol to measure this uh, acute production of oxytocin in humans and also de uh, developed a way to safely shoot synthetic oxytocin into the human brain, which I've done safely about 700 times to show the causal effects. And what we found is that it seems to be a key signaling molecule that says this person in front of me, maybe friend, maybe stranger, is safe. This person is someone I want to interact with and motivate social interaction. And it does it in a couple of interesting ways. It reduces physiologic stress. So now I get a somatic feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, I can always articulate this unconscious way deep in the brainstem, evolutionarily old stuff. Like, oh yeah, Rich in school. Like you said, we're friends. Like, we had a great conversation a couple of weeks ago and we just kind of clicked. Why is that, right? What, what, so something in our brain says, Rich, fine. And then your producer, Nick, very sketchy guy, I can just tell you from, from talking to him for two minutes. Right, so we, we can't live in communities. We can't be around people. We can't do extraordinary things like you've done in your career without having that ticker in your brain that at least you know, imperfectly says safe, not safe, trustworthy, not trustworthy. 
Yeah. So it reduces physiologic stress. And then lastly, increases our ability to share emotions with others. So if we think about how to work effectively as a high performance team, one of that is training cognition, right? You do this, I go that. We're going we're gonna, to uh, bridge a room. You're going left, I'm going right. We know how to do those things cognitively, but there's also this level of emotional connection yeah. in which I can have this innate sense that this guy is now a weak link, right? He needs my help, or I got to cover him, or this person has some great leadership skills, or right now, take point, you are on, right, on task. And somehow we know that. So oxytocin accentuates our ability to absorb those, those emotions and allows us to be much more effective social creatures. Yeah. Um, and so I want to talk about specific things that produce oxytocin and certainly get into oxytocin and stress because that's a huge uh, factor of, of some of the, certainly the work I've done. Uh, before I do, though, oxytocin, as I understand it, is a hormone, not a neurotransmitter. Um, or am I incorrect about it? Is that, in fact, a transmitter or, or is it is it what is oxytocin? Is it a neurotransmitter yeah, hormone? Right. Yeah. All those things. Okay. Dopamine, neurotransmitter hormone, serotonin, neurotransmitter also works. So hormone means it uh, binds to uh, organs in the peripheral nervous system. A neurotransmitter and neuromodulator means it's active in the brain. So oxytocin is made in the brainstem. It's a really weird uh, neurochemical that's so evolutionarily old. On stimulus, and we can talk about what causes your brain to release this, it's released in the brain, but also in the bloodstream. Okay. So you have this kind of interesting feedback loop. So prior to the work I started doing in the early 2000s, it was just known to be associated with birth and breastfeeding. It's kind of a mammalian reproductive behaviors care for offspring. So one of my cl uh, colleagues who's uh, uh, OBGYN, I first started getting interested in oxytocin, said, oh, it can't be very important. It's just for women. And then we have this interesting anomaly. Why do men's brains make oxytocin? Under what circumstances? What might it be doing? So evolution is very stingy. And evolution is a conservative. It does not want to produce some of the energy producing neurochemicals it doesn't need. So it reuses them. So in the brain, the, the oxytocin is called a neuromodulator. So okay. it basically modulates the activity of larger circuits and other neurochemicals. So we're really talking about oxytocin in the brain as a neurochemical, uh, even though it has those, for example, relaxing effects in the peripheral nervous system, the behavioral effects come from the brain. Again, how do we know that? I can shoot it up your nose into your brain. And I can see these effects occur where if I give it to you peripherally, say with an IV, I don't see those behavioral effects. I'm sorry, that was too much of an explanation. No, I love it. I, yeah. What we're talking about here is now interaction. So you say, you know, what promotes or, or inhibits its release? And that's where things get really interesting, uh, particularly for the work you've done in your book. Uh, because your brain's so lazy, it takes 20% of your calories to run your distal three pound organ in your head, yeah. super high overhead. The brain just wants to kind of uh, idle most of the time. So you need a little bit of stress. You need a reason for the brain to go, oh, I need to draw on my social resources so that I'm going to release oxytocin and be an effective team member. So uh, like most things in biology, there's sort of inverted view curve. Uh, uh, you know, moderate amount of stress is good, right? That's, again, for, for the work you've done. You're on. You are focused. Uh, can I use a bad word or no? Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. Shit's going down, right? Yeah. Like we, we got to be on, right? So I, I'm now I'm keyed in, right? I have a reason to kick in with the rest of my team. Now, if I push that really far beyond that inverted view, where now I am so uh, frozen with fear, I can't move, I'm in survival mode. I'm just trying to get through the next two minutes. So at least from what I've read uh, from, from um, you know, biographies, advice, and combat, you know, are often initially in combat, you know, people pee themselves, very common, and you're kind of frozen. And then, okay, bullets are going by me. Okay, no, I got to remember now, I got training, the stuff I have to do, right. and then you acclimate to that. And that's, I think, what's really interesting about your work is that inverted U curve is not fixed. I can move that inverted U so I can do incredible amounts of stress and still be a really effective team member. So just yeah. to cap that off, we've done a ton of field studies everywhere from Papua New Guinea to uh, sports teams to soldiers. And what we see is that before a very competitive event, an increase in oxytocin, an increase in testosterone, an increase in cortisol. So I'm, my brain is getting ready to compete with an out group, but I'm also ready to cooperate with my oh. in group. And that's a crazy neural ballet, right? That only works with training. Right? Right. It's not like you can come in and go, oh, I'm going to beat uh, whatever uh, Venus Williams in tennis. No, you got to be freaking trained to do that, right? Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. so same thing with, with your work. And I think anybody's work, right, you have to 
you know, train to get good. And then you have this, you know, prior to that, you have sort of imposter syndrome where you go, what the hell am I doing here, man? I, I don't belong with these guys. These guys are superstars. Well, so let's so let's let's talk about that, and it kind of bridges into another question I had, and and the, the question I had focuses on duration, um, and and kind of the long lasting versus the short term. I mean, what I understand in my um in my very um uh, uh, limited understanding of neurology and neurotransmitters is that you have some of these chemicals that that burst in. They're like they're they're like the the fast fuel. They come in and they also leave your system rapidly. Um, but we all know that that trust sometimes can be different. There's a there's a lingering effect of trust, right? Or or the feelings you get after a great conversation. You and I talked a couple of weeks ago. I felt great after our conversation for several hours, right? What is happening with it, what is what is oxytocin's involvement in that that long lasting trust versus that that kind of spur of the moment trust? And where does that all fit in? Great neuroscience question, Rick. Perfect. So um, again, because the brain is so lazy, it's a it's sort of a, a start signal. So I'm supposed to release, hey, Rachel, is safe, we're cool. What happens down uh, within the next couple seconds is that the brain releases more uh, serotonin in the synapse. So that's kind of relaxing, inhibitory neurotransmitter, as well as more dopamine, particularly in these midbrain so-called reward regions. So it says, oh, this is the good feeling you've got, right? Like, I'm relaxed, this guy's cool, we can hang out. We're going to talk about, you know, next time we travel near each other, we're going to go have a beer and hang out, right? We're just going to have fun conversation. So how do you know that, right? Versus Nick, who I don't want to see again in my whole life. So, um, yeah, I know. He's fine. Right? So um, so that's that sense that basically reinforces this loop that says, oh, here are my people. I am safe around these people. So because your brain's so lazy, you don't need that oxytocin spike anymore. So what's really interesting is that oxytocin is that key signal for uh, it's stronger for strangers than for people I know. So people you serve with, your family, your friends, when I walk in the door and I see my wife, I don't need to release oxytocin because it's metabolically cheaper for me to use memory and goes, uh, here's a lady that's only trying to murder me twice, but most of the time she's nice to me. And so I can be relaxed around her. Right and now. these are basically, are these, are these neural networks that are getting forged, really? That exactly ultimately are, right. They're just super highways of information. It's like, okay, I know this person, I trust them. And it's already, it's, and is that why when someone who's forged that with us breaks our trust, it's so disruptive because we're, it's not just a, it's not just like the stranger who I, who I had a good feeling about suddenly, you know, betrays me. It's like, oh, okay, that wasn't, there was nothing forged there. But when there's something forged there, that's, is that why breaking trust is so painful? Yeah, it's like an anomaly in your environment. You know? yeah, so, yeah. You, again, I'm a math guy, sorry. But, you know, if I look at um, ranking my interaction with anybody, if you, as zero, one, one positive, zero, negative, or neutral, one, 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 I get a zero, I go, oh, what's going on here? But here's where the neuroscience comes in. So often, particularly when we have maybe 10 or 20 ones, but not 2000 ones, uh, you know, positive interactions. You know, we think in our brains, all right, Rich is a, is a bad guy. I was wrong about him. So that's called the fundamental attribution error. So I'm attributing your behavior to a personality trait. What we see neurologically is often that is a person who's just fine socially having a bad day. So that's very high level of stress. So maybe your dog died that morning or, or your lack of sleep or lack of food. And, um, I'm, you know, we see this all the time in our in our daily lives in which people are just super cranky for for some weird reason, you know. Right. Um, and, and then, you, you know, you, you know, if if you have good prefrontal cortex, you inhibit that desire to, to, you know, flash out at them and you go, OK, this this person's having a bad day. So let me let me step back. Let me not do that knee jerk behavior. Uh, it's hard. It's really hard. But I think, again, understanding that this is likely uh, a kind of a neurologic um, uh, interference effect as opposed to you're an innately bad person. So let's just go through the data real quick. About 2% of the population are clinical psychopaths. So these people lack empathy. They use others. Uh, they, they can't be remediated. They get in a lot of trouble. They have disordered thoughts. We've studied them pretty intensively in prisons. And they have a dysfunction oxytocin. They just don't connect. Yeah. So two percent is not bad, right? Two percent means you got to cut those people loose. Um, we find about five to six percent of the population, again around the world, are people with fine oxytocin social systems that are just having a bad day, and the other, you know, ninety-six percent, sorry, ninety-two percent, are people having a good day all the time. So yeah. most of the time, most people can do that. But I think what's interesting in your work is moving that inverted U curve, where I can train myself to be more adaptive with this team. I can train myself to understand 
that these folks are people that I can um, work together with, very natural social creatures. So again, for people listening, um, you know, if you took economics 101, uh, they would say, you know, labor provides just utility. So that's a fancy way of saying work sucks. It sucks so bad, we got to pay you to do this job. But, you know, in, in your career, Rich, in my career, uh, oh, man, I get to do the coolest stuff ever. Um, I, I like Mac, the yeah, title of Matt Best's book, if you read that. Um, thank you for my service. Like, I got the best job ever, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm getting to do I'm special forces. I'm doing the coolest stuff ever. So I feel like in my job, I think your job, yeah. the reason we put so much energy and passion into this is because we were constantly evolving. We're learning new things. And like, I found my little niche where I could be good at something. So, so with there's people a couple that, that can help me. With people going to help me. And so there's a couple aspects and I want to dive into one of those. There's the, but the first aspect is, especially in professions like mine, where it's, uh, you got a tight group of people, we're doing something, you know, that's risky, but we're, there's, there's some performance and competency inside of that that helps build trust. In other words, I can lean on my teammate because I know he is going to do what he needs to do so that we all uh, persevere, we all survive. And, and that's inside of, could be inside of very stressful events. But um, if I if I back that up to basically SEAL training, you know, which sucks, right? That's like the it's it's just there's no other way to put it. It just sucks. Um, there is no competency inside of SEAL training that's being uh, that's being shown. In other words, you're just you're just you're share you're sharing suffering. And I know you've talked about oxytocin spikes when there's shared suffering. And so so SEAL training, regardless, we there's so many examples of people who share bad moments and that shared suffering spikes oxytocin what's going on there yeah so sure shared suffering together and synchronization of behaviors is a key way to stimulate the brain to make oxytocin so again you're not carrying the log by yourself you're carrying it with with six other guys right so okay. all right that's important you're learning to carry that boat together again you never do this you know in combat it's it's to show that when things get really stressful yeah, right. you can still perform. So it's giving you that confidence in the people around you and confidence in yourself that you can do this thing. So again, for listeners, you know, who are not in the military or you know, regular jobs, the stress is important. So I used to think Rich, like, you know, these um, companies that would have, like, we're going to go whitewater rafting. I'm like, ah, what a waste of time and money. But if you think about it, that's a stressor in which you have to work together. That's a way to build those social bonds. So yeah. one application of this is, as we are transitioning slowly to people coming back to the office, I first of all have different levels of anxiety. So some people are going to be more comfortable. Some people are going to be less. That's normal variation. So don't, if you're a business leader, don't freak out about that, number one. But number two, you know, have that bonding opportunity, right? So we're the early adopters into the return to the office uh, system. So yes, yeah, show up. Uh, yeah, it's slightly higher risk of infection, not super high probably. So be safe. But now we're the pioneers and we get to have this bonding experience. And so right. creating that stress, a big uh, client project you've got to get to, even travel, I'm thinking international travel, like the people I've worked longest with, I've traveled around the world with, and you're tired and hungry. And then, man, these people still perform. And you're like, yeah. oh, well, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, so and, and there's a, there is a distinct difference between shared risk and shared suffering. It could be, they could be, together right but what we're saying and what you're saying is really it's all about the behaviors you're doing something with other people and behaving in a way that is consistent with each other uh and that's what's that's what's building that that oxytocin whether it be i'm jumping out of a, a plane with a bunch of people at twenty thousand feet shared risk or i'm freezing in the surf zone with uh a, a bunch of people shared suffering same it's kind of that same behavior thing exactly right and so i think you know, we, we certainly hear about snowflakes and all that who want to avoid any kind of stress. It's not good. It's not good for your health. It's not good for your immune system. It's not good for your psychology. Yeah. Moderate stressors that you can overcome is so valuable. So if you a short story. So uh, I took my daughter, probably 11 or 12 at the time, skiing for the first time, snow skiing. We were, we're beach people, so it was kind of a new thing. And, you know, bunny slopes, bunny slopes. And then, finally, okay, we're going to try the intermediate slope. You know, end of the day, it's getting a little bit icy. And what happens? She goes down, she falls a couple of times, scrapes her knuckles, her knuckles are bleeding, and she's crying. She doesn't want to do it. I said, okay, you got to do it one more time, then we can go home. Uh, one more time. And then you know what happened, right? She went down, she killed it. Right. Now she likes skiing, right? right? So again, it's that, like, I can't do this thing. Oh, now I've done this thing. But look, you had a mentor, you had a coach, yeah. you had someone who was more experienced that said, no, you can do this. 
I'm going to stand there with you. Whole different ball game. And if you're by yourself, you're like, oh, screw this, man. I'm bleeding. <laughs> I should go home. Yeah. But when you have someone who says, no, it's okay. So I think it's the same thing I've heard about SEAL training where somebody, once somebody you know said, the thing that let them, got them through buds was the instructor saying, we're not going to ask you to do anything that you can't do. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is hard, but I can do it. Oh, that's, that's a change in mindset, right? So I think if we have that kind of change in mindset, particularly when you're doing things as a team, hey, I'm, there's a team of us doing this thing. Let's, let's group together, right? And let's get through this thing together. It might be hard, yeah. but right. if it's important, if it's hard and meaningless, you know, you should have bored, in my view. Yeah, like, yeah. But this hard and meaningful has purpose. So I think that's really important. Well, Bud says both hard and meaningful and hard and meaningless. But <laughs> but I guess you could draw a meaning. Uh, but it actually brings up a good point out because I want to talk about those behaviors that actually the, the, the top behaviors that actually spike oxytocin. I'm going to I'm going to start with one, though, because it's one of the most predominant ones, certainly in the SEAL teams and that I talk about a lot. And that's humor and that's laughing together. Uh, the humor factor is probably one of the most predominant things I've ever I ever saw in the SEAL teams. It's certainly one of the things I miss the most is the ability to make jokes, especially in times of stress and and misery. Someone cracks a joke and you all laugh and you feel better. And I know this is because laughing generates these these uh, these chemicals and and one of which is oxytocin. But let's can you talk about why humor, why laughter is so powerful? And did you actually study uh, laughter and oxytocin in some of your work? Um, I haven't studied laughter and oxytocin, but I certainly know the literature. So yeah, you get this oxytocin and dopamine response, like in movies. If you're in a movie by yourself or watching at home, you don't tend to laugh out loud or not that much. But in a group, in a theater, you're enabled to do that. So there's this kind of feedback from the group. Um, so yeah, big stress reliever and particular teasing, right? So if I know you well enough, right, I can begin to tease you about your weird old looking earlobes. I'm just making this up. Your earlobes are fine. But right. So if you can start doing that and oh we really know each other. Like teasing people, it, it has to be some truth. If you tease people right. you don't know, it's just mean. Yes. But if you yeah. know people, right? So it's the kind of humor sometimes that happens under stressful situations in which, you know, um, you know, I think that the uh, the time together and stress together are very important. So yeah. the more time I can spend with you, particularly if we're doing something uh, particularly for active people like us, then I get to know you more and more and more in all kinds of different situations, some stressful, some not stressful. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, really important. So humor is there. The other thing is touch, and we've talked about this, right? So one thing you see in the military uh, is high levels of trust. Um, I was at uh, West Point many years ago uh, giving some lectures, and all these all these guys were poking me and grabbing me, and, and, and you know, so we certainly have said touch as a way really talks to us, an appropriate touch, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And if I say, like, what the hell's going on? They say, oh, they train us to do this. If we need to convey information, I'm going to break the space barrier and I'm going to grab you physically. So I'm getting somatic feedback. We have to do this thing now. Okay, good. You got my attention, right? I'm, I'm in, I'm on, right? This is yeah. going to go. So again, that's a kind of different uh, story, but uh, touching, hugging, you know, that it's, it's a very bonding experience. And I think some people sometimes don't realize in the military how much touch is important. <laughs> Right. Well, it, it's, it can be detrimental for someone coming out of the military who in a, you know, jumps into a civilian role and starts breaking space and, and getting in people's faces and they don't understand what that means. But, you know, it's interesting that you bring up. I remember my wife, my, when I met my wife, I was already a SEAL. She didn't know really anything about SEALs. Um, her only experience was the movie The Abyss and, and that, in that movie, all the SEALs go crazy. <laughs> but um, uh, I remember as she started meeting my friends and, and meeting more SEALs, she said at one point, she's like, you guys are the most huggy people I've ever seen. Because we were always like, whenever we saw each other, we'd hug each other and all that stuff, you know, you know, the bro hugs and things like that. And, yeah. and what I realized in, in reading your work and, and seeing this, this is one of the key ways that you see these bonding things. Even when we see athletes slap each other on the ass or, or, or pat each other, these are all uh, I guess cues um, where you're 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 generating that oxytocin exchange, correct? Yeah, exactly right, and it's a very effective way to do it without using words. So I don't know about you, but I'm not generally a very expressive person. But yeah, yeah I can grab one of my friends around the neck and and punch him or whatever, and then he knows I'm saying, "Look, I love you. You're one of my guys." Whatever. So again, I think it's just a different way to express it. Yeah. Um, so again. I, I, Obviously appropriate. So I'm I'm kind of famous for for uh, hugging people rather than shaking hands. But I was pre announced. I can't hug everybody, and then almost everyone goes, "Oh, that's great, sure." Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And then every once in a while, someone's socially anxious, or whatever, or you know, they, oh, right. it's okay. I can I can shake hands. I'm able to do that. I just <laughs> I do, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so to me, that's a hack. So um, I'm 
I'm, uh, you've got to take your own research seriously. So if I want to connect to people rapidly, if I hug them, then it's basically hacking your brain that goes, oh, here's one of my people. Right. Yeah. Okay, because right. who do you hug? People that you're close to, people that you, you've connected to. Right. And so, again, you can accelerate that process if you think a little about the neuroscience. Let's talk about, because I am, a, I am an animal lover, and I'm sure there are people listening who are animal lovers. Does this, this, I, I'm assuming this, this goes both ways in animals as well. Our, our, our pets, when, we, when we, we hug, we touch our pet, our, or we pet our pets, that's an oxytocin exchange, correct? Absolutely. So we've seen it many times. I just looked at my big German Shepherd sitting yeah. here uh, next to my feet. So, um, yeah, so uh, we say that in both directions. One, uh, we look at uh, people just petting random or playing with random dogs or cats. And um, uh, something interesting happens. So uh, oxytocin is released in the human uh, irregularly with, with pets. But if it's your pet, for sure you release it. That's that, see, that yeah. reciprocal bonding. Uh, but what's interesting is pets may be training us. So dogs release, induce in humans more release than cats. But if people have had in our study four or more pets in their lifetime of any type, birds, snakes, dogs, um, then Four is a threshold. Then you always release oxytocin when you interact with any old friendly dog. Oh, interesting. Right? So, okay. so think how interesting it is that we created dogs, right? Which is the most common. Yeah, pet, yeah. Right. Yeah. So they are our best selves in some sense, right? Always loyal, happy to see you, always happy to do something. Um, and so they may be training us. So maybe we domesticated dogs so that they would domesticate us. Oh man, that's really interesting. So quick thing though, you I remember you saying something about oxytocin in mammals. Does it apply to snakes and reptiles and other? Uh, you know, kind of different pets like that? I mean, uh... no, it doesn't really. Yeah. Okay. So I used to have a boa constrictor and I would say, I love this. You only have to feed it once a month. So when I traveled, it was just, it was happy. But, you know, it gave, I say it would give great hugs, but no, they don't have this kind of response. Fish, fish do, but it's just a different mechanism. It's really much more uh, basic for reproduction. Okay. Um, so All it's right. really mammalian things. So uh, if, where I live now, we have wild burrows. It's a long story, but it used to be a mining area and, and they move around. And so over time, they, you know, there's a herd of them, 40, 50 of them. And my daughter and I just spent half an hour hanging out with them and slowly acclimated. They slowly came over to us. We started petting them. Now, they're wild animals. But, you know, why are we scratching their heads? Yeah. It's normal bonding behavior, right, if you're a safe animal. And wow. so, you know, it, it is possible to do that. Again, you guys, be careful if you're listening. Don't, don't be, you know. Don't, don't jump don't, into the safari and, and, and sit with the lions without, yeah. Yeah, I was saying, we have mountain lions where I live. So, yeah, I, I you know, I'm <laughs> always looking for that mountain. No one ever scratched the mountain lion. Right, right. Yeah, interesting. So, okay, so we talked about physical touch. What are some of the other, like, really key, powerful behaviors that generate oxytocin? Yeah, almost any synchronous activity. So one thing I thought about is, like, boot camp. Why are we marching in unison all the time? Is that, that synchrony? So same thing with dancing, singing together, anything you do synchronously works. Oh, okay. If there is stress, better, right? So think of performers. Right? You're performing, you have an audience, you have humans looking at you, you've rehearsed this thing, you know how to do it, but that's a you know, great way to bond. So again, think of actors on a, on a movie set or a TV show. I do kind of bonding, um, partially because they're allowed to kind of emote more than in normal life, I think, but also because you have an audience, you've got to perform. So. Um, you know, I think we all have a little bit of performance anxiety, but if you can get over that and perform, it's really important. So having an audience doing something publicly, is not bad. So again, bringing back the most people's lives, um, you know, being recognized at your work for being a high performer publicly, much bigger oxytocin and dopamine hit for maintaining high performance than if I just email you a thank you or a Starbucks gift card or something, right? Yeah. So that kind of public component. So really thinking about all the social behaviors that we do as humans, and again, putting that stress in there. So um, again, from a work perspective, we would call that challenge goals, right? Right. So, right. you know, uh, giving people more and more goals so that they can accomplish more and have that sense of mastery and that established me as, establishes me as part of the team. I am contributing more and more to the success of my organization. And, and the, so it, just to, to key in on one of those things, in the, in the public, in the audience uh, factor, the audience is, is providing more oxytocin for those who are doing the deed, correct? Or is it, is it actually getting exchanged in between with the audience as well? Or is it just, I mean, how does that work? Yeah, getting exchanged, exactly right. Right. Oh, wow. So okay. when you do, and uh, you do a lot of public speaking, I do, and it took me, Rich, probably, I don't know, three or four years before I had been on stage enough 
where you can do things that professionals talk about actors, where you can read the audience, you can talk and have that out of body experience and yeah. then kind of start absorbing that energy, right? So that's that flow getting super natural, sorry, super natural, not super yeah. natural. It's natural for, for, for social creatures like us to be able to do that, to fit into that audience. And also it's uncomfortable when the audience is not happy. So I'd certainly given a couple you know, talks in my life where you know, you hear the the rustling paper and you go, yeah, oh yeah. man, these people are not with me. This is yeah. this is not pleasant. But you know, bombing as a as a comedian would say is also a learning experience, but also means you need to pivot, right? So yeah, yeah. now we're now we're back to what is my my group of people going to do? Even if I'm the only one on stage, they want me to be successful. So when I spoke at TED, the nicest thing that the TED curator said to me before I went on stage was because I was so nervous. Oh my God, you're know, super nervous. Because it's gonna, you know, go online and presents of people will see it or love it or hate it. Yeah. He said, everyone in the audience wants you to be successful. Yeah. Right. So very much like the the guy in still training, right? So right. if you think of that, right, unless people are really evil, which most right. people aren't, the humans around you want you to be successful. So yeah. I think this again moves into your work, which is uh, from a leadership perspective, a lot of this is coaching, right? I'm going to give you some skills and I want you to practice those. You're not going to be great at them at first, but I'm going to give you feedback. And that rapid feedback, if you trust the person, oxytocin, connection, okay, this uh, man or woman wants me to be better. This yeah. is the tennis coach. This is right. So from a leadership perspective, it's really not about you being so awesome and successful. It's really taking the people that you lead and helping them elevate. And when they're yeah. successful, gosh, you're a superstar. Which is a great thing to kind of key on for leaders because this is why honest, candorous feedback. So giving giving bad news, um, but in a way that tells someone that you care about them and you want them to succeed, will in fact induce trust versus versus uh, disrupt it. Correct? Yeah, exactly right. So that kind of radical candor. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have kids. I love my kids to death. They are accountable. When they make mistakes, they get feedback and they get lots of pause praise and big cheerleader. But if I didn't care about them, I wouldn't give them feedback like, oh, whatever. Be right. your class. I don't give a crap. Yeah. Right. So I think, you know, that's the important thing. But you've got to gather that safety, that oxytocin that's right. and trust first. First, yeah. I'm just if I'm hired the first day and you come in and yell at me, not appropriate. Right. Yeah, so yeah. um, but if if you sit there and go, so my pet one of my pet peeve words of the many is human capital and work. I I don't know who invented that, but I think it's evil. It says you're a machine, you're replaceable, you're you have a mechanism. You're a human being. And I think, again, for listeners, it means people are going to have good days and bad days. People are going to respond differently to different kinds of coaching. And you've got to kind of specialize to that person, but also no one's perfect, right? You are not yeah. perfect. No. So accept that that uh, that difference. But in that difference, you also may find little pearls of wisdom. Like, yeah. oh, this guy did this thing differently. We call that an innovation. If it's a positive deviation, we call it a mistake if it's a negative deviation. But if you don't have deviation you'll never have innovation right. so let's just keep innovating and then you know, if that didn't work say i'm a leader i'll go hey rich so how, how did that uh, new new approach i'll go oh man if we have trust you'll say yeah. oh man and that sucked i burned two days didn't work at all right. okay uh, let's talk about that so um as you know in where i live silicon valley is very common to have monthly congratulations you screwed up celebrations so right. let's go in and talk right. about the things we try to do to innovate, yeah. have beef and beer, share the information so no one else does it, but also celebrate that we try to try innovate. To yep. and, and as from a leadership perspective, your job, I think, is uh, risk mitigation, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe letting you spend two days trying this new thing out is okay. Spending two years, probably not appropriate, right? There's, there's some kind of feedback. But yeah. in, in the coaching world where I'm checking in with you daily or even more than daily, How's it going? Are you reaching your goals? What do you need help with? Right. That's where that feedback loop is real tight. And from the brain perspective, it says, oh, this person cares about me and my performance. Right. right. Not just performance. They have to care about me. So last thing, I'm sorry, I'm on a little bit of a rant. This, but, this is great. Yeah. But it's building that, that caring relationship. So you're not a piece of human capital. You're a human being. And I'm, for the people I work with, I think we should be invested in the human, not in the performance. Yes, I, I like to do both. I like to have the human perform really well, right? Yeah. But um, so an example is when people want to leave. So when I do a, a when I do this forward-looking annual review with the people I work with, and the question I ask is, where do you want your next job to be? Here, elsewhere? Let's talk about that. Where are you going? Am I helping you get there? 
Yeah. Right. So if it's here, awesome. If you want to go work at Google, also awesome. Right. Why? I got a guy at Google now. Right. So, yes. you know, if I want to do a project with Google, I can just call you up. So that's right. good for me. It's good for you. But also if you're trapped here, you're not going to perform well. Right. No. So to have that growth, that, that development of mastery, you know, mastering new skills. Yeah. Well, one of the things you also said that I think, and I've said this before, one of the most difficult um, uh, aspects of leadership is giving the people in your span of care the space to fail. Um, and oh, by the way, the same thing with parenting too. <laughs> Hard yeah. to, we have to give our kids the space to fail or else they'll not learn. We can't helicopter parent that we have to let them fall off the bike to learn how to to learn how to ride it. So I want to, I have to remember we have an audience because I have, because you and I can get in these, uh, <laughs> in these conversations. If you are watching and you have questions, just go ahead and throw them in the chat and I'll see if I can um, ask Paul the questions. I did have one question come in from LinkedIn prior to talking about happiness and how happiness is related to trust and oxytocin. How are those, how are those, how is general happiness related to all of this that we're talking about? Such a deep question. So I, I'm going to shamelessly plug, I have a book coming out this summer uh, called Immersion, The Science of uh, Extraordinary Experiences and the Source of Customer Happiness. So oh, right. I spent a lot of my career studying happiness individually in groups. Uh, and the answer is slightly complicated. So I want to, um, instead of taking 30 minutes to give, do give, it, give, us a, give us a preview and seconds. then I'll have you on after the book comes out and we'll talk about it oh, in depth. So. <laughs> bless you. Yeah. So, so basically when we, most of our long-term life satisfaction comes from connections to other people. Yeah. Right? And so oxytocin facilitates that. And the short answer is the more I connect, the more I have these amazing social experiences, the more my brain adapts to it and the easier it is for me to have them. So um, like anything you're doing that allows you to be more present, more connected, meditation, uh, walks in nature, the more you do that, the more you want it. And we see that this builds life satisfaction. So people who are happier live longer and live healthier. And the reason for that is uh, stronger and often more social connection. So if oxytocin is the social connection neurochemical, you can train your brain to get better at this. So Rich, I don't know about you, but I'm a super introverted dude. I mean, I'm taking it now because I'm talking to you. But I could spend 12 hours not talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. But I realized from my own research, oh, I need more social connections. No, because it'll make me happier and healthier and um, not make me such a weirdo. Uh, and so I turned 50 a couple years ago. I had four surprise birthday parties, right? Not because I'm so awesome. It's because I spent time investing in those social relationships. So I right. think it's a question of how do you invest your time? And even if you're a selfish bastard and you want to live longer and healthier, you got to build some social relationships. Yeah. And how do you do that effectively? Now we're back to your world. Do an activity with your friends, particularly if it's moderately stressful, right? Yeah, could be taking a walk, could be hiking, yeah. could be shooting range, whatever those things are. If you can amp up skydiving, could you know, if you kind of amp up some of that uh, adrenaline, you can actually build bonds more rapidly. By the way, yeah. it's perfect for people who are single and dating. So if you want to have the world's, you know, first date count for 10 dates, take a helicopter ride at sunset, go skydiving or rock climbing, yeah. and do something that's actually active, physical, and a little bit scary. And man, it's a great bonding experience. Yeah. So and yet, you also, help the kids. Yeah. And you tease out some attributes too. So you have to see, see some of those hidden qualities as well. Right. So, um, yeah, the way I, I the way I helped my introversion was I married an extrovert, and she's my you know Kristen is she's always helping me get out there and, and meet and talk to people. Um, all right, we got a, a little bit more time. I have two more questions that I want to ask. Um, first is this idea that I've I've heard and, and read about how um, acts of kindness and generosity towards other human beings generate oxytocin, um, but even witnessing acts of kindness and generosity towards other human beings also create oxytocin. Is that true and why? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, we're, when we say we're social creatures, it means that neuroatomically, we have so many receptors for oxytocin in our frontal cortex that we're just super sensitive to social information. So Rich, you and I have never had this experience because we're much too macho, but I've heard that people occasionally cry at movies. <laughs> Neurologically, that's interesting, right? So then the movie, The Boy Gets a Girl, people cry. You're cognitively intact. You know in your theater, you're where these are professional actors. You know it's a fictional story. So that's the witnessing, right? When you witness something beautiful. Um, or, or if there's something, you know, um, um, emotionally powerful, um, uh, you, uh, I... I was in Washington two weeks after 9-11 uh, at the Pentagon, and uh, it was just uh, 
uh, well, you know how it was. Yeah. And anyway, did a ton of work on, on um, uh, let's say, war on terror generally on the Intel side uh, for many years after 9-11. And anyway, I think the 10 year anniversary of 9-11, there was some documentary that my kids were watching. I wasn't paying attention. And I saw the planes hit the, hit the uh, towers. I started bawling and lost it. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Neurologically, yeah. it's interesting. Like I didn't know this was so emotionally important to me. Yeah, yeah. So that's the first thing. The second is generosity. So again, here's the here's a hack for the listeners: if you want to connect to someone, give them something uh, meaningfully, and it's better if you can say why. So I'm looking for a prop. You know, if I give you these, hey Rachel, I thought you might like some mints. It's different than you know, what, Rachel. I really value you as a friend, and you've been great. You've been a friend of mine for 20 years, and you've always been great to me. And I really know you love coffee. So here's some here's a basket of coffee for no reason at all. So with a spouse, with a friend. So if you express the words why, then you actually add that emotional component, right? If you just yeah. give them something, it's okay. Um, so we did a, I don't know if you saw this, people can Google it. If you Google my name and uh, chocolate study, you actually see a film of a study we did for a chocolate company in Denmark, exactly with this, right? Let's give, give uh, gifts. And not only does the uh, receiver of the gift get oxytocin released, but as you said, Reg, it bounces back to the giver. So now we're in this nice loop where we're just feeling connected to each other. And the observer, someone observing that also gets it because they because they because they see that, right? So it, it actually jumps to people who are actually watching that. Right, which is yeah, just because, super it, because weird. of the emotion. Yeah, because of the, yeah, because it's funny, of the emotion. You should, it's funny you should say that because I I just the twentieth anniversary obviously came, just came and I was watching, I sat down with my sixteen year old to watch the very well done documentary, I think it was on Netflix. And uh, we we hadn't got through the first three or four minutes. And I had to turn it off because I was too emotional. Um, now, I, right. we went back and watched it later, but he, my son was looking at me. He, I mean, of course, he kind of understood why, but, uh, but you're right. Those things come back to us. But here's a quick question off topic because you, it, it, it boiled up while you were talking. When I was a younger man, uh, you know, teenager, young 20s, I never cried at movies, wouldn't even think about crying at movies, right? Then I got married and I had kids and I started feeling more emotional when I find I watch Finding Nemo suddenly I feel more emotion and now as a as a you know almost 50 year old I'm way more emotional when I watch things why is that is that I mean what's happening there you're gonna get an a plus for that question Rich <laughs> oh my god a plus question so what is the anti-oxytocin what inhibits oxytocin release there's a couple things with high levels of stress but also interestingly testosterone so what happens to young males? They're literally testosterone poisoned, right? Yeah. 10 times. So as you get over 30, your testosterone begins to decline. So now this balance between oxytocin and testosterone starts to stabilize. When you have children, your testosterone goes, goes lower, which allows more bonding to them, which evolutionarily makes sense. I don't have any data for this, but in my experience is if you have little girl children like me and you pick out dresses every day, your testosterone goes to zero, you become a big girly man. Uh, so that may only be me, right? So it's okay. As we age, we have more opportunity to connect, right? And yes, so yeah. it, in studies that we've done in my lab, we administer testosterone or placebo to men. So essentially creating alpha males, we find these alpha males are overconfident. They are self-interested as opposed to other interested. Um, they um, take way more risk, right? So all these things are sort of, classically associated with young males. So I think yeah. what's interesting about um, military training in general, but SEAL training in particular is it's breaking down this all about me. Right. And it's now all about us, right? I'm putting you in this unit and I've got to break that down hard because when you're a 20 year old, 19 year old, 18 year old, you are just full of energy. And testosterone, by the way, is the freaking wonder drug, man. So I have this weird ethical thing that when we do drug study, I take the drug myself so I can say to participants, we have ethics approval, and I took this drug for two weeks. Right. You know, it, it, it's you got a lot of energy. So again, right. don't abuse. It's a scheduled drug. Don't abuse it, you guys. But it's very, very powerful in terms of your ability to really focus, to not need sleep, to have high energy. Yeah. And so this is the teenage boy stuff. So right. again, there are ways to modulate that besides being in the military. But it's sports, for example, is a great way to do that. But you know that focus, that um, ability to just do this. Rich, I have a question for you. So I actually told my kids recently, my kids never saw me cry either after the 9-11. They're like, we've never seen you cry. What's happening? Yeah. What's with you? Um, I realized that like knowing now how hard it was for me to go through five years of graduate school to get a PhD, I would never do it again. I mean, emotionally hard. I wasn't sleeping. I lost weight. 
you know, the whole thing was just absolutely stressful. Knowing now, looking back at your younger self, would you have still gone through SEAL training, been a SEAL? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. I would okay. go through, I would go through again. Um, I would, I, I would, I would love to go through buds again just to see what it feels like and just to get the, get the feelings again. I just know my body wouldn't keep up. Um, right. But it's because you find and you, re you recognize, certainly after the fact, you recognize those moments. Um, and I think even after 20 years in the SEAL teams and having to go on combat and stuff, you, you actually become much more um, adept at, at finding humor and finding ways to hack into um, good feelings, even in misery, uh, finding the funny in the miserable. Uh, and so, so yeah, I would, a hundred percent, I would do it again. I, and, and you also learn things about yourself and you create bonds. Um, let me ask you this, cause I know we're gonna, we're gonna kind of land this plane here in a second, but a part of the reason also why we, as, as we get older, we might um, be more emotional. Is it also because with experience, we actually gain empathy. We gain the ability to be empathetic to others experiences and situations does that does that make sense i mean i feel like i've gained empathy as i've gotten older um and is that related to uh trust and oxytocin and and this emotional stuff really good question i wish the easy answer was yes um it's complicated so i think part of the thing we see in younger people teenage is um that the area in the brain that allows us to process information uh, and make good decisions and prefrontal cortex is actually not fully wired up until people are around 30. Right. Right. So that's why I think for young people, we need guides. We need um, opportunities to fail in a safe space. We need a chance to grow because we're, we're still impulsive. Uh, so women mature a little uh, faster than men neurologically, not surprisingly. Um, so once you have this prefrontal cortex, which primarily is inhibitory for these kind of knee jerk responses, our, our brain is now a little more integrated, if you will. And so now I can understand others more effectively. So, so um, it doesn't seem to be a real oxytocin effect, although that kind of tolerance for, for weirdness, we're all weird. I mean, neurologically, behaviorally, we're all weird. So but once you have been around enough weird people, it doesn't seem to bother you anymore, right? So, um, so really, I think it's, it's this uh, prefrontal cortex ability. And then just having been on the planet long enough where you go, yeah. things happen, it's okay, right? And right. Again, a small subset of things I need to really worry about. Um, but, you know, gosh, how blessed are we to be on this planet, uh, you know, have these great lives, you know, walk in nature, have people that care about us. Oh, my gosh, you know, that's actually amazing. And so, you, you know, you can appreciate that when you're in your 50s like we are. But, you know, when you're 18, hell yeah. no, it's all about no, me. So, so that's okay. So people evolve. And I think we should give people the space to do that and, and even facilitate it if we can. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fantastic. All right. Well, we have gone now 47 minutes or so. I, we could go for a long time. We're going to do this again. So that's a, that's, that'll be a, a certain, I want to just thank you for, for being here and thank you for giving us all that, uh, all, all of your knowledge and not all of it, certainly a taste of it. Um, and to my audience, look up everything Paul Zach. He, there's a great TED talk on morality. He has a bunch of the chocolate experiment and then, and then of course his books, Trust Factor. Um, and we're looking forward to your new book too. So, uh, so uh, look up Paul and, and his work. And Paul, I will look forward to the next time we can talk, but thanks for, for being on today. Absolutely, Rich. Yeah, it's 